Hey, uh, same, same game. The drill's no different. Open for discussion. We just didn't put them in a circle because we're going to go through a lot of slides that are going to show some numbers. And one of you guys will be able to look at them a little more easily. But it's the same mentality. For any question you want, nothing's off limits. We're going to talk about labs. Uh, because this tends to generate a lot of questions. There's a lot of, you know, what's normal, what's not normal. And uh, what do my labs show? And this is one of my favorite of all time. Mm -hmm. So, Mom, what's normal? Oh, it's just a setting on the dryer, dear. And, <laughs> you know... <laughs> When we talk about labs, that's what we constantly want to know is, are my labs normal? Well, there's such a wide variety there. Um, normal for you, normal for somebody 10 years younger than you, normal for the situation, uh, and, and you can't make in, there's very few labs, very few labs that you can look at and go, oh yes, this is clearly abnormal without getting the other half of the equation, which is how do you feel? Without the clinical picture, a number in and of itself doesn't always mean a whole lot. So we're going we're gonna to run through some discussion about sugars and cholesterol, because that's a problem that most people want to solve. And then we'll get into some other things. And this may end up going into a second week. So we're going to go an hour, and wherever we are, we are. But we can get into thyroid, we can get into hormones, we can get into all kinds of things. So, pop quiz, what is the number one cause of death in the United States? Anybody have an answer? Heart disease. Heart disease, right? Everybody, everybody has some clue to that. So, if it's heart disease, what do we do to identify the cause and reduce the risk? So, what test do we do? If you want to know if you're going to have a heart attack in five years, what test would I give you? Cholesterol. Most people would say cholesterol, and that's exactly right. And that is what we do. The question becomes, <clears throat> is that a valuable test? The majority of people who suffer a heart attack have a normal cholesterol panel, a normal lipid panel. A lipid panel is your total cholesterol, your LDL, which is termed the bad cholesterol. Let me get this right. The bad cholesterol, the same cholesterol that makes hormones in your body, the same cholesterol that makes cell membranes in your body, we're going to call that bad. Does that even make sense? No. You get an LDL and you get triglycerides, okay? What are triglycerides? Quite literally, they're fat in your bloodstream, okay? We'll talk about the difference between triglyceride and, and is, is that ever confused anybody? Cholesterol versus triglycerides? A little bit. They're both fats, that's what they are. They're just fats. It's just triglycerides are fat used for fuel, where cholesterol is fat that's used to make things like cell membranes and to make hormones, okay? so. So let me get this right. The number one cause of death in this country is heart disease. And the test that we use to identify those at risk doesn't identify those at risk. If the majority, what if you had a normal cholesterol panel right now? You'd go, oh, I'm really happy about that. Oh yeah, you're in the majority of people that have heart attacks with a normal cholesterol panel. So that's not really good. So how can a cholesterol panel identify that? It really can't. It really can't. So question number two. What is the number one cause of the number one killer, heart disease, in this country? What do you think the number one cause of, of heart disease and, and heart attacks are? Any thoughts? I already kind of poo-pooed the idea that it's LDL cholesterol, right? Because it really isn't. And that's what we thought years ago. Years ago, you go back to the 50s, and Eisenhower was in office, and he had a heart attack. And we didn't know what a heart attack was. And some of you have heard me talk about this topic before. And so... The American public saying, what's a heart attack? A heart attack? I don't know. Myocardial what? Infarction? What's, what's that? And so the American Medical Association had to come up with some answer for the American public. Imagine you're Eisenhower's doctor and all the journalists are there and they're putting that microphone in your face saying, what, what causes heart attacks? And we really didn't have an answer. And so Ansel Keys, who was a scientist at the time, said, fat, fat, cholesterol is the cause of heart attacks. And it wasn't true, but at the time, we really didn't have a solid answer. And the AMS said, yeah, what he said, we're going to go with that answer. And so that's what kind of led us down that path. Well, now fast forward some 50, 60 years, and we've learned that, oh, well, we were wrong. Cholesterol isn't the cause of heart attacks. So what is? And really the answer is inflammation. So then the question becomes, well, then what's the cause of inflammation in our bodies? And largely, it's blood sugar. 
in this culture, in this country, because we are the kings of making heart attacks. We're great at it, right? And we're the kings of diabetes, and we're the kings of overweight, because our diets lead us there. We eat the worst diet on the planet. Nobody comes close to eating the garbage we eat. And a large part of what we eat is high sugar, high, high fructose corn syrup, high carb, high starch, things that turn to sugar very quickly. So here we have insulin resistance and diabetes, okay? Other acceptable answers would have been inflammation and sugar, is the cause of heart attacks, all right? So what tests do we do to perform, what tests do we perform to identify those at risk for blood sugar problems? Brent, you got this. Glucose? A fasting glucose, right? Yeah, that's what I was going to say, fasting glucose. Everybody knows that. Right? Don't eat anything. Go get your blood sugar test. That's what we do. Did you know that a fasting blood sugar will miss 40% of the people that are either frankly type 2 diabetic or of insulin resistance? So it's right 60% of the time. So why, why do we... Why are we doing it at all? It's wrong at all. Why are we doing that test at all? That's my question. And there's a good answer to it. It's not a happy answer. Uh, but it's a truthful answer, and we'll talk about that in just one second. But if it misses 40% of those people, only a two-hour postprandial challenge is capable of uncovering this consistently. Yeah? Postprandial. Oh, I'm sorry. Postprandial means I just ate something, and now I'm going to get my levels checked. A fasting means the opposite. Fasting means I haven't had anything to eat since 11 o'clock last night. I've had no food in my body for 10, 11 hours, and now I'm going to check what my love. Because your body does something very different, doesn't it? When it's in a fasting state and you've slept through the night, you're at a whole different physiology. When I dump sugar or calories into your body, that's a different physiology. So postprandial, intentionally, I'm going to give you 75 grams of carbohydrate. What does that look like? That looks like a bagel and jelly. If I gave you a bagel and jelly to eat and then two hours later checked your blood sugar and insulin, if your mechanism, if your machinery is working well, what should I see? A relatively normal glucose under 100 and a relatively normal insulin well under 20. Your sugar went up, your body went to work, it brought it back down, and everything's cool and groovy. But what if your body doesn't work well? The sugar goes up and insulin goes up and they both stay up, and now we're at the two-hour mark, and they're still up. That's a problem. That's showing that the insulin receptor is not working well, or the mechanism isn't working well, or there's some defect there. And there's a lot of things that can trigger that. Because I have people that eat a great diet, and their sugars are still high. So there's more to it than just what you eat, but that's the common pathway that most of us head down toward inflammation. Right? Other things that would make your blood sugar high when you're eating a great diet is your endocrine system doesn't work. Your hormones are off. Your thyroid is off. Your cortisol or stress pattern is off. Or your sleep is terrible. All those things will cause blood sugar to go up. Okay, but that's the endocrine impact of that. So there's a book by Joseph Kraft who's done more to our post he's done more study of this than anyone, and he's demonstrated that very, very clearly. So if I have this right, we use a very poor test when there are even better tests available to uncover cardiovascular disease, the number one killer in our country, and we use a poor test, to a cheap, inexpensive test that we can do that would do a much better job. And you have to ask the question that was just brought up, why? Why do we do that? Well, who runs medicine? Doctors, right? Doctors are in charge. No, not for, <laughs> used to, <laughs> not for a long time. So if I'm a doctor, I work for an insurance company, and insurance companies love to hire accountants and really watch the books, okay? So I'm not saying we shouldn't have insurance companies, but the emphasis and, and the management that they, or the control they have over medicine is embarrassing, all right? So if I work for an insurance company, I take my orders from them. And if they say, well, Dr. Huber, I don't want you ordering these tests, because they cost more money. And I can say, yes, but if we do these tests, we'll uncover problems before they develop, and we're going to save billions of dollars by not having heart attacks and strokes. I know, but it's going to cost me $10 more today. It's crazy, but that's the truth, right? So if, an, if you work for an insurance company, and all doctors do, 
they tell you what test to order. And they've said, we're going to order the lipid panel and we're going to order the glucose panel. Okay? Even though the test that we would normally, the test that I would do to uncover real cardiovascular risk and blood sugar, they're less than 100 bucks. Less than $100? Yeah. And we could really uncover this. So, unfortunately, that's the state of affairs. So, in medical therapy, and this is not, I'm not here to beat up on traditional, they have to understand that this is not pointing a finger at any doctor in this city or any doctor in this country. The doctor is working under a system that disadvantages their ability to work. But we're not taught how to make somebody healthy. We're taught how to treat diseases with drug therapies, okay? We're not taught about anything about nutrition or dietetics. We're not taught about sleep and stress. When it comes to stress, we're taught that there are only two, two ends of that spectrum, right Viv? You either have Addison's or you have Cushing's. An a complete lack of cortisol or an absolute abscess. Or abscess, excess, right? But there's, there's nothing in the middle. It doesn't even make sense. Life doesn't work in black and white. So life's full of grays. Exercise, we're not telling anything about type, duration. In fact, in last November, November 2013, they came out with new statin guidelines. And one of the first things they said was, when treating cholesterol, Lifestyle and diet and exercise should be your force, first course of action. And you know what recommendations they gave after that? Nothing. It was lip service. Because when it came to exercise, they offered no guidance about the type of exercise, the duration, the intensity. They offered no guidance. So it was a statement that they could check off. Now, as we get into statin dosing, here's what you start with. Okay? So we're not taught about those things. And in fact, lifestyle, meditation, mindfulness, balance, if you went to your doctor and asked him about those things, as willing as he is to help, he, we don't have any tools. We're not taught how to do these things. So uh, there's no effort to reverse or prevent the diseases that we have. So let's get into the real labs and understand what they really represent. Everybody knows the bell-shaped curve, right? And we're, we're hopefully somewhere near the middle, okay? And we hope that our our fifth grade teacher was going to grade on a curve. That was going to be very helpful to us. But if you look at blood sugar, this is taking which people do we grab when we come up with this bell-shaped curve? Is this a curve of healthy 25-year-old males? No. Is it a curve of 32-year-old women? No. This is everybody. Young, old, sick, healthy, cancer patients, heart patients track athletes, okay, is in this bell-shaped curve. Does that make sense? So when we look at it, from 70 to 100 is a generally accepted normal range, 85 being the mid, okay? So is, it, is there a difference if you're here versus over here? It can be a big difference. You can be right here with 100 being the upper limits of normal. You could be 98, and hey, your blood sugar is normal. That's awesome, right? You and the cancer patient next to you and the obese person behind you, you're all at 98. Congratulations. That's not, a lot of, that's not a lot of help. What if we began to look at things such as there's a study, 46,000 people, that for every point above 84, right? For every point above 84, you have a 6% increased likelihood of developing diabetes in the next 10 years. Mm -hmm. Now how comfortable are you with your 98? Your normal 98 not so comfortable. A normal blood sugar of 95 equals a 66% risk of becoming diabetic in the next 10 years. And if your sugar is 99, you have a 90% chance of becoming diabetic in the next 10 years. So like, like most things, huh? It's inevitable unless you reverse the diet. It's inevitable unless you decide to change why it's 99 or why it's 96, right? You can be frankly diabetic. You can be a type 2 diabetes on insulin, on medicine, and you can decide, I don't want to be diabetic anymore, and you can move to being non-diabetic. You can make that change. Even with the uh, genetic factor involved? What genetic factor? Parents. How big a factor are your parents? Um, well, it's not mine, it's his dad. Small. Genetic, okay. Small. small. Type 1 diabetics, <laughs> the vast majority, 90% plus of type 1 diabetics that are insulin dependent are born to normal, healthy parents. They're not born from diabetics. Type 2 diabetics are born without diabetes. If it was a genetic disease, you'd be born with it. The only thing you're born with is a predisposition that's low, moderate, or high. And even if it's high, the vast majority of control 
is lifestyle, not genes. Okay? Everybody in your family is type 2 diabe diabetic. You have less than a 50% chance of becoming diabetic. Your lifestyle has to be in accordance with their lifestyle to generate those genes being turned on, becoming active, and producing that same result. Okay? If you don't engage in their lifestyle, you're not going to activate that gene pool. Okay? So, isn't that huge? That's a big difference, right? And you can, and you can push that backwards. So if your blood sugar is over here, how would I take my blood sugar from being 96 and move it all the way over to being 75? What factors affect that? Diet, exercise, exercise sleep, stress, thyroid, hormones. You have lots and lots of tools to do that with. So, diabetic risk. Below 85, awesome. Your risk is zero compared to average people. As you go to 92, it's 48. As you go to 98, it's 84. And at 126, you're diabetic. A fasting blood sugar of 126, quote unquote, you get a badge that says, I'm diabetic. What are we taught to do with somebody whose blood sugar is 110? What are we supposed to do as doctors? Viv, what do we do? We do nothing because you're not diabetic yet, right? You're not normal. We're going to watch. We're going to watch. Bill, we're going to watch this. Uh, you should eat better and uh, exercise. Well, doctor, what should I be eating? I have no idea, but you should eat better, all right? Because we're really not trained in what to teach people to eat. Okay, 154 pounds. Every single woman in this lineup is 154 pounds. Do they all have the same blood sugar? Do you think there's individual variation? Yeah, there's a lot of individual variation. So when we look at that, when we look at that bell-shaped curve and that skew, remember there's a lot of variables within there that affect it. She's very tall and lean. Somebody else may be a little rounder, okay? And so weight isn't necessarily the deciding factor. Your genetics play a role. This is what we're taught in school for the most part. This is a fasting blood sugar. This is two hours postprandial. I eat the sugar load and I see how my body's doing. And notice what we're taught. Normal, less than 110, okay? We're pre-diabetic if fasting were less than 126, and we're not taught to do anything until we're above 126. We're not taught to do anything. And then postprandial, if you've eaten that bagel and jelly, normal is anything less than 140. Okay? In this practice, we tell patients, you should be less than 100 postprandial. That's more aggressive. That's, that's stopping it before it gets too far. All right? Postprandial, pre-diabetic, as long as you're under 200, you're safe. All right? I mean, by then, you're already on your way to insulin resistance. You're on your way to becoming diabetic. All right? But again, we're not taught to do anything until we get to the red zone, which I think is problematic question for you. So you said you guys want to judge it at 100, right? You said you don't want to do it above 100. Really right. Correct. Right. Here. So what would be a normal like average? I mean like 80 something or 90 something for a healthy person? Like for a healthy person postprandial? Yes. Like 80, 90, 70. Anything under 100 and I'm pretty content. Okay. And uh, because you have to look at the insulin with that. To look at glucose, somebody can do a, a two hour postprandial glucose, come back and they're less than 100 but their insulin's 48. That's pretty high. In other words, they're making a ton of insulin to keep that sugar under control. <laughs> so it's a matter of looking at glucose and uh, insulin together. We look at both of those, all right? Because that's what Kraft showed in his book, that some people, well, hey, their sugar looks great, but their insulin's way up here, and insulin's very harmful to the body. Too much of it is very inflammatory to the body. And other people, their sugars are up, but their insulin's down. And other people, there's, so there's different blends, different mixes of insulin resistance on the way to becoming diabetic. What do you want the sugar less, the insulin less than? Two hours postprandial? I'd like to see it less than 20. And I consistently see that in people that are truly healthy. And if we look at that, not that we want to start labeling people diabetics, but if your insulin is coming in at 32 and your sugar was 105, that's not bad, but it's not great. And it's telling us there's a little flaw there. So what are we starting to see? If I see that, are you starting to develop some risk for inflammatory disease in your body that will lead to heart disease? Yes. When do you want to put out the forest fire? When it's a smoldering ember at a campsite or when it's a raging inferno? 
I can tell you from experience, it's much more fun to put out the little smoldering ember than to try to collapse a, a raging inferno, okay? So how do you do that? So you come in and we do this test and your blood sugar is 115 fasting. There's a number of things we can do. Now we're getting into therapeutics. It's a nice talk just about labs. But the very first thing is take the sugar out of the diet, right? What's the most sugary food in your diet? Sugar. <laughs> no. <laughs> Wheat, all right? Wheat will make your blood sugar rise higher and faster than eating sugar cubes. Isn't that amazing? The glycemic index of sugar is lower than bread. Mm -hmm. Because fructose has a lower glycemic index, and sugar is half fructose, half glucose, where bread is amylopectin B, and it just turns to sugar very quickly, or amylopectin A. I'm sorry, amylopectin A. All right, so you've got some understanding there. So things that alter blood sugar, diet, whether you're eating grains or bread or processed food, high fructose corn syrup or snacks, exercise impacts your blood sugar, not just because you're burning calories, Exercise actually makes your insulin receptors work better. You can make less insulin, okay? Sex hormones, yes! Estrogen, testosterone, progesterone all have a beneficial impact on your insulin receptor and your blood sugar. When do women tend to gain weight and have more problems with heart disease? After menopause, okay? Yes, they're getting older, but their hormones have left the building. And we know from many, many studies, no matter how you slice it, if a guy's testosterone is low, his blood sugar tends to be high. If you took a room, the study has been done, they took a room full of guys and they just measured testosterone and they lined them up from high to medium to low in different quartiles, okay? And if your testosterone, if you happen to be in the high group, you tended to have a very healthy blood sugar. And the guys that were in the lowest quartile for testosterone tended to have a higher blood sugar. They did the opposite study. They looked at blood sugars and they ranked high to low, and they measured their testosterone, and guess what they found? Every time sugar was up, testosterone was down. Same study with CRP. CRP is a marker of inflammation in your body. If your CRP is up, you're at risk for heart disease. As testosterone stays up, CRP tends to stay low. And when testosterone goes down, CRP, a marker of cardiovascular risk, goes up. So very much these are important. Thyroid, if your thyroid's low, your cell can't process sugar. Sugar stays in the bloodstream, it goes up. Stress and cortisol. Under stress, our bodies are putting out sugar, right? We're getting ready for a fight. Mother Nature has taught us that if we're under stress, that means we're in jeopardy and we should be ready to fight. So my blood sugar goes up to prepare my muscles to fight. Sleep, it's a stress signal. If my sleep is bad, the body says, sleep's bad, what, what's wrong? There's tigers, there's famine, something's wrong. Get ready to fight. Bring the sugar up, okay? Toxins, pesticides, plastics interfere with the receptor sites so they don't work very well. So have you heard of the expression or the uh, test hemoglobin A1C? Maybe you have, maybe you haven't. It's another test of sugar because this is a red blood cell, okay? A red blood cell, these are sugar glycation on the red blood cell. A blood cell lasts about 90 days and then it dies and gets replaced. So it's giving you the average of what your blood sugar was over that time frame. Because if your blood sugar is high, you're gonna get blood sugar sticking to the red cell. If your blood sugar is low, there'll be less sugar sticking on the blood cell. Does that make sense? So the red blood cell is just walking around for 90 days, giving you an idea of, is there a lot of sugar out here or very little sugar? And if we looked at hemoglobin A1C of six versus five, five is very healthy. Six is almost diabetic, okay? So it gives you a range. And all it's telling you is how much sugar is sticking on your blood cells. Yeah? If you know your average um, you know, blood sugar levels, can you be able to track your A1C? You can, you can guess, you can predict. So if you know what your blood sugars are, let's say you had a bad month and you noticed, hey, it's the holidays and my sugars are trending up. If you went and checked your hemoglobin A1C, it's gonna give you the average over a 90 day period. And if you stayed with those higher sugars, you can guess that the hemoglobin A1C is ticking upwards. So there are two better tests than a simple blood sugar. Fasting blood sugar, that's okay. But a two hour postprandial check is more decisive, more accurate. And this can be another, another way of checking, okay? And as God has a sense of humor, 
the two hour postprandial and the hemoglobin A1C don't always look equally askew. Okay, one might be not so good and the other one looks pretty decent. That's just the nature of the human body. There's so many other variables involved. But these are better tests we can do. Are any of them expensive? No, they're not. They're not really expensive. So why aren't we doing them? Because the, again, the insurance company wants to save five dollars even if it means they could save a million dollars by stopping a heart attack. I had one insurance guy tell me, he worked for the insurance company, I said, why, why don't you guys spend money on prevention? He goes, do you know people change their insurance every year or two? In this crazy market of ours, people change their insurance every year or two. He goes, why would our company want to invest any money in prevention only so that that client can go over to the other insurance company next year and they'll reap the benefits? I said, well, that kind of thinking is not going to get us very healthy. So that's unfortunately what we're stuck with. So it makes sense overall. So cholesterol, I put up this beautiful picture because this is where we all live in our minds, right? At least we should. We should have a place like this to relax in. But this is Fiji. And I read some articles on heart disease and cholesterol levels in Fiji. And they eat a lot of coconut, a lot of coconut oil. Huh? And a huge amount of fish. And they tend to have cholesterols that run in the 240, 250 range. It's not unusual for somebody living in Fiji to have a cholesterol that high. Yeah? Is that, well, I was going to ask, is that high, low? What's the reference point? That would be high. In America, based on old standards, not current standards, but un unfortunately, old standards live on until old guys die off. <laughs> so, in current standards, we would say your cholesterol should be below 200. Now, there's not a lot of strong evidence to suggest that that's a true statement, but that's what the statement that doctors were taught for years and years, your cholesterol should be under 200 to be healthy. Well, there's a 250. And if your cholesterol, total cholesterol is 250 in the States, you'd be put on a statin or some medication to bring that down. Yet they don't have heart attacks. Why don't they have heart attacks? Wait a minute, their cholesterol is high? They're not having heart attacks? Because LDL and cholesterol are not the cause of heart attacks. What, else, what, are, what are they not doing? They're not going to McDonald's. They're not driving their car all over the island. They're walking. They're not eating processed foods. They're not eating high fructose corn syrup. They're not checking their iPhone every five minutes. They are sleeping through the night, right? It's lifestyle. It's lifestyle. It's a whole. Would you sleep well if you were there? Oh yeah, man! Most of them don't live like this. They don't have any electricity. So. Fijian people are fabulous. So Viv has been there. Yeah. Yeah. Very nice. People. Yeah. So it's a whole different lifestyle, right? Different. So what drives heart disease? Is it just cholesterol? No. It's what are we doing to our cholesterol? Are we torturing it? I've decided that firemen are the cause of all fires. They must be. Because every time I go by a fire, I see firemen right there, right? It's that kind of thinking that led us to say, LDL must be uh, causing heart attacks. Because every time we see a heart attack, there's LDL. What are you doing to the LDL? Are you torturing it? Are you oxidizing it? Are you doing bad things to it? So a cholesterol panel, why? A cholesterol test is $8. And for the insurance company, it may even be cheaper than that. And that's what you get, triglycerides, HDL, total cholesterol. The majority of heart attacks we already talked about uh, a normal lipid panel in most heart attacks, uh, but doctors work for insurance companies, so that's what we're taught to do. Are there better tests? Well, let's understand a few basic things, okay? When we measure LDL, this is an LDL particle, okay? I like to think of it as an M&M. There's a candy coating in a nice gooey center, okay? So the particle, this is an LDL particle, this is the cholesterol, okay? This ApoB, that's the special key that goes up to a cell and locks into a cell and feeds triglycerides and cholesterol into the cell. Okay, these are little dump trucks that go around your body dropping off triglycerides as fuel, dropping off cholesterol as building materials. They have a job, they're not evil. Satan didn't put them there, okay? And that's how they work. Here's a different view of it. We have this outer shell and the cholesterol is in the middle. The ApoB is the docking station, all right? So that's a healthy, normal 
and we talked about triglycerides and cholesterol. Cholesterol builds cell membranes and cholesterol makes hormones. We love LDL cholesterol, it makes testosterone. All right, and triglycerides are just fuel. It's just fat inside that turns to fuel. All right, what if we looked at the size of these particles and how sticky they were? Ah, now we've got something that starts to show us what our risk for heart disease is. So, we have two guys we got Bill and Stanley right here. And Bill and Stanley both have an LDL cholesterol of 130. Their LDL cholesterol is 130. But Bill has his 130 milligrams divided amongst five big fat particles. And Stanley has his 130 milligrams stored in nine smaller particles. Same amount of cholesterol. But Stanley's risk for heart disease is much higher. These smaller particles are dangerous. And the fact that we have more of them is dangerous, okay? So the size of the particle and how much is more important than how much cholesterol we have. You see that blood vessel? Are blood vessels made of rubber? No, they're made of fibers, right? And fibers crosshatch like this. What if, what if I rolled a marble over my hands right now? Probably would roll over. What if I rolled BBs over my hands? They would fall through the holes, okay? And the same thing can happen with the lining of your blood vessel. The big, fat, large particles flow right through. But the little ones, uh-oh, uh-oh, the little ones are falling through the cracks. So this guy has a lot of large particles, not very many small ones, and they're not going through the vessel to the other side where they can create inflammation. This has a lot of small particles. See them all accumulating underneath the membrane of the blood vessel? Okay, so my shirt is a blood vessel. Those little particles would be coming, popping out, okay? They'd be popping out and getting on the other side of the vessel. So the size of the particles is important. Does that make sense? Does that help graphically? Your lifestyle, your diet, is going to play a key role in whether you have large or small particles. Fish oil plays a part in that. How much inflammation you have, how much sugar you eat, how much exercise. Once again, lifestyle is one of the biggest factors in changing that particle size. Yes, can we use nutrients and supplements to change that? Yeah, we can use things like red yeast rice. We can use uh, other things like niacin to have an impact here. Okay, but largely this is because of a bad lifestyle. So again, another example, we've got Jerry, Susan, David, and Maria. And notice one particle big, two particles, four particles, eight particles. They all have the exact same amount of cholesterol. But Maria's in trouble because she has her 125 divided amongst eight particles. And she's full of small particles where Jerry has the exact same amount of cholesterol, but he's only got a handful of big ones. Okay, so size is important. Inflammation drives heart disease, not LDL. If nothing else, you're going to go home tonight knowing that LDL has very little to do with my risk of heart, heart attacks. Okay, is the vessel inflamed and is the LDL oxidized? I have a picture, I couldn't find it before tonight's talk. I have a picture of this beautiful red sports car and it's shiny, I mean, it's glistening. Okay. And that's what you want your blood vessels to be, slick, smooth, waxed. And then I have a piece of steel wool. I'm going to walk up to that red sports car, and I'm going to go. Are you cringing? I was. Okay. What's it going to do to the finish of that car? It's going to make it rough. Okay. That's sugar. The steel wool is sugar on the lining of your blood vessel. So sugar versus vegetable. Sugar on the inside of your blood vessel roughs them up, makes them irritated. Now you're likely to form plaque. Sugar also drives oxidation of LDL. There's a lot of things that will drive the oxidation of LDL. Oxidation just means I'm ripping electrons off of it. Okay? When your car oxidizes, it rusts. It looks bad. Same thing can happen to your blood vessels. They can rust. Okay? If we oxidize something, we're pulling electrons off of it. Now, if I'm an LDL particle and somebody just pulled a, an electron off of me, I'm pissed. I'm an upset LDL particle, right? And I'm likely 
if I'm going through an inflamed blood vessel, I'm going to attack to that blood vessel and I'm going to begin to create what's called a foam cell or inflammation. And now we have to develop the beginnings of development of inflammation that leads to plaque. Plaque is what lines our blood vessels in an adverse way. All right, so the cause of heart disease is inflammation, not LDL. And how can we measure inflammation? We can measure it by CRP. C-reactive protein is a marker of how inflamed somebody is. If I put a thermometer in your mouth, I can measure your temperature. I can't tell you why it's high or low, but I can measure what it is. If I measure your CRP, I can tell if your body's inflamed. I can't tell you why it's high or low, but I can tell you it's inflamed, okay? And so here's a bunch of different markers, lipoprotein A, homocysteine, total cholesterol, LDL cholesterol, ApoB, CRP, C-reactive protein, all right? And what this is telling us is the relative risk for future cardiovascular events. In other words, what has the greatest ability to predict who's going to have a heart attack? That'd be valuable information to have, wouldn't it? And we see, if we look at, at right up here, total cholesterol and LDL cholesterol are right here. It has some ability to give us some clue of somebody that might be at risk. But notice where CRP is. CRP is more than twice capable of LDL at predicting who's at risk. Wouldn't that be valuable to know what your CRP is? Now, who wants to know their CRP versus know their LDL? I don't care what my LDL is. I want to know what my CRP is, right? At least first, that's what I want to know. So it's the ability to predict an ApoB, this is another name for particle number. Remember we talked about how many particles you have, a lot or a little? So ApoB as a predictor is better than LDL. So what if I measured my ApoB and my CRP? I'd be light years ahead, right, at being able to predict. There was a study done looking at that CRP versus LDL. The white bars represent LDL, the gray bars CRP. And this is the ability to predict any cardiovascular event or the ability to predict coronary heart disease, heart attack risk. And notice how much more predictive the gray CRP bars are versus the white LDL bars. It was more than twice. What does CRP stand for again, did you say? What? What does CRP? CRP stands for C-reactive protein. It's a reflection um, of cytokine activity, of inflammatory chemicals. Let me take it back to, I'm healthy and I get a cold, I get a strep throat. My body has a way of making inflammatory chemicals that come out and smash the strep, beat up the virus and kick it out. That's awesome, we want that. Okay, and that's an elevation of our C-reactive protein, inflammatory cytokines. But what if I don't have a cold? What if I'm just eating garbage food, I'm not sleeping, and I'm overweight? My body becomes inflamed, and it starts making interleukin-6 and interleukin-1 and TNF-alpha all the time. My big belly is making those cytokines all the time. So my CRP stays elevated all the time unlike a cold where it's elevated and then it goes back down. So CRP is there to protect us. But when we torture our bodies and make our bodies inflamed in general, our CRP tends to stay high, okay? So seeing that the CRP is high, because what's the cause of heart attacks? LDL? No. What's the cause of heart attacks? Inflammation, okay? And CRP is a marker that this body's inflamed. This body's on fire. It's gonna blow up. That's what it's telling us. Okay, does that make sense? Any questions on that? So to get a CRP test is hugely expensive. I think it's like $18. You can request this from the doctor? You can. He's not likely to do it because if he does, the insurance company will smack his hand. Can we just pay him? Yes. Well, you can pay me. I'll get one for you. <laughs> <laughs> so Low-density lipoprotein, if you oxidize it, if you rip electrons off of it, you make it an inflamed, irritated, angry animal. Can we measure oxidized LDL? Is all this available for less than $100? Okay, we can measure LDL, we can measure CRP, we can measure all these markers very simply. And oxidized LDL, is it a predictor of heart disease? Well, let's go to the big board and look. This is adjusted odds ratio. This is the ability for any of these markers to predict a heart attack or to predict a vascular event. 
total cholesterol, LDL, uh, lipoprotein, PLA2, that's another marker we won't get into, triglycerides, total cholesterol, HDL, oxidized LDL, oxidized LDL in relationship to HDL. Look at the relative predictive ability goes from 1.2 to 1.9 to 2 to 6 to 8 to 13. Okay? That's 13 times more predictive than just looking at total cholesterol or LDL cholesterol. So if you had the option of looking at one number, what number do you want to look at? I want to see this. Yeah, right? It's total HDL. Yeah. It's oxidized LDL divided by HDL. But even if I just looked at oxidized LDL by itself, much more predictive. So all I'm trying to convey is that looking at an old-fashioned lipid panel, HDL, LDL, how excited are you by that right now? Not too exciting, is it? It's not too predictive. And it's not very helpful. Old hat medicine. Old hat Cleveland medicine. Clinic does Cleveland Clinic rank number one hot uh, hospital in the world doesn't use, they use what, we, what Dr. Huber and I are using this test. We're going to show you what, yeah, what they do, which is what we've been doing with our patients for years, because it's exceedingly affordable, it's far more accurate, and it gives you a better picture. And I'm going to show you a good example. Let's, let's look at this panel, and let's just look at the old-fashioned lipid panel, okay? Total cholesterol. 190. Hey, we're under 200. Nice job. Let's look at LDL cholesterol, 110 or 111. Most docs would say, I'd like that below 100. Are you going to get upset about 111? No. So what would most doctors do with the, with the LDL cholesterol of 111? Not bad. You look pretty decent. All right. Let's look at HDL. It's only 30. It's low. I want to see old HDL come up. Two of the best agents to raise that are exercise and fish oil. So, hey Bob, get some exercise. I can't tell you what kind or how long or what intensity because I have no training in that area, but get some exercise and take some fish oil. Okay. And look at triglycerides, 244. Well, that's kind of high. Not certain what to do about that. We do have medications to lower triglycerides, but they're problematic, okay? And current recommendations don't recommend using them. Do statins lower triglycerides? No, not to any significant degree. Okay, so that's a pretty decent panel, isn't it? Pretty decent. Total cholesterol is 190. Triglycerides are a little high. And by the way, triglyceride is what in the bloodstream? Fat, unadulterated fat. All right, why is it high? You know what it's telling you? Your blood sugar's up. A high triglyceride is telling you that your blood sugar is high. How do we know that? Well, when your blood sugar goes up, what do you make? Insulin. So I eat a big donut and my blood sugar rushes up and the blood sugar is high, so the body says, oh, look at all that sugar. But I make some insulin. We make insulin to take the sugar out of the bloodstream and put it in the cells. That's its role, okay? But when insulin goes up, it tells the body, do not burn fat. Attention, body, please do not burn fat for the next five hours. That's the message of insulin. Well, triglycerides fat. And then at lunchtime, I have a sandwich, two big pieces of bread and some chips. <gasps> more sugar, more insulin. Attention, body, please don't burn any fat for the next five hours. And if you do that consistently day after day after day, and you go home and you have your pasta and then you have your snack, if you're consistently keeping sugars high and insulin stays high, you are not going to burn triglycerides. And the body's just going to accumulate them. You're going to accumulate them in your bloodstream and in your pants. Okay? You're going to start to gain weight. So this is a sign that blood sugar is high. But otherwise, not too bad. Now, let's go to the next level. Let's look at particle size and particle number. The particle number, LDL particle number, says how many of those particles, not the cholesterol inside, but how many particles we have. 2,100. Ideally, we want those less than 1,000. 2,100, that's not good. That's a lot of particles to float around. How big are the particles? LDL size. 19.6. Uh-oh, they're small. We want them to be bigger than 20. They're 19. So we have a lot of small particles. Remember that picture, how the little small particles fall into the wall and create inflammation? Okay. Well, this is not looking very good. What else can we look at here? Well, for the most part, we've covered 
particle size and particle number. So the regular panel looked pretty decent, but the particle size and number were a problem. What do you want to see? Come on. Huh? Oxidized LDL. We want it less than 44, it's 57. So the oxidized, the LDL is irritated. It's been adversely affected by sugar. Remember, sugar is irritating, right? And it's ripped electrons off the, oxid, off the LDL. Now the LDL is pissed. And all it needs to do is find some inflamed blood vessel. Well, we know the blood vessels are inflamed. We know it for two reasons. The triglycerides were high, therefore they must have high sugar. And we know it because what else is high? C-reactive protein. If CRP is high, that's telling you, your body's inflamed. Your blood vessels are inflamed. If CRP is high, is your risk for heart disease low or high? It's high. If your oxidized LDL is high, your risk for, for a heart disease is high. And you have big part or small particles, and you have too many of them. Now how confident are you with that total cholesterol of 190? Feeling pretty happy now? <coughs> no, I'm thinking, holy crap. But my insurance paid up, okay? So, does that make sense? This guy's forming plaque right now. Every hour of every day that he walks around with these numbers, he's making plaque. And at some point, that plaque reaches a critical mass, and the vessel occludes, and he's in the, heart, he's in the ER having a heart attack. And that's a very unhappy day. Right, Viv? Right. Very unhappy day. And the thing is that you can have a... a Cardiac cath done, and you can have the vessel looks completely normal because the inside the pipeline, like here, it looks fine. But the plaque is from inside; it's where the, the particles are going inside. So the plaque is forming here, okay? It's forming down and down here. But then one day, like a pimple, it suddenly opens up and squishes out. <laughs> okay? Did I explain it clearly enough? So. So it, it's very ugly. You can have a normal cardiac cath and then three months later. You can have a normal stress test. I don't know how many times I've heard somebody had a normal stress test yes. and three yes. months later they yes. had a heart attack and died. Okay. But you would have hoped the cardiac cath. So now they're doing a cardiac cath and doing an echo with it to try to see it. So, so stress tests are great. CT scores are great. They give you some idea of, of who can be at risk. All right? Why aren't we doing this? But looking at the chemistries, tells you what's going on. You can't see this on a heart cath. You can't see this on a CT, but you can see it on a blood test. So all these things collectively give you a much better picture. But this is the earliest signs. Long before you can see anything on a, on a stress test, right. you can see it here. Okay? Or yeah. Or CT, what, what, what do you call it, the CTN? CT calcium score, yeah. cardiac calcium score. Yeah, those are great tests. Okay. Do you have a question? Well, I'm just confirming that you know, even if you had normal everything in the, in the cath lab, mm -hmm. it's the C-reactive protein, protein that's the biggest marker. Yeah, the, the, the other, there's one, only one caveat with the C-reactive protein. If you have a bad infection going on, C-reactive protein is there to clean up infection, okay? And it's a marker that we use also. Patient comes in with belly pain or something like that. We wonder if they have acute appendicitis. We get a, a CRP on them. Okay. So an elevated CRP can reflect a number of things. It's not specific just to heart disease, but but yeah. it's uh, it's so. Also, but the oxidized LDL is going to tell you a lot. If if the it is a, oxidized LDL is a very good figure. <coughs> Those two together really help. Yeah. yeah. So we look at these markers Following. as a collective. I look at them as a panel of a lot of different markers because, again, God has a sense of humor, and the oxidized LDL will be high, and the triglycerides will be high, and the CRP will be normal. Well, that doesn't make any sense. So we look at these, and we're trying to grade as a group. Are you low, medium, or high in terms of your marker? Because what's your hemoglobin A1C? What's your two-hour postprandial? What's your oxidized LDL? What's your particle number? What's your particle size? What is your C-reactive protein? What's your oxidized LDL? But when you look at all of these in tandem, if, if six of them look great and one of them's high, eh, I'm not as concerned. You've got to try to figure out why, but you get the sense that you have a much better understanding of what the biochemistry is really doing, okay? And that's where you can really stop a heart attack before it ever happens. 
And we've seen that happen. We've seen guys come in with numbers like this, and they're an absolute mess, and you follow them. They lose some weight, they change their diet, they start to sleep, you do some things to change the stress in their, in their physiology, and these numbers turn absolutely upside down. Okay, CRP drops below one, oxidized LDA, LDL drops within the normal limits. Blood sugars, they stop being di diabetic. Okay, all these changes, but it's all related to lifestyle. You're not gonna change all those markers just putting somebody on a statin. Statins don't do that. All statins do is lower LDL, okay? Now, there's some, so this is kind of the broader panel, just to give you an idea, we're gonna look at all these markers, and they're not always gonna line up and be perfect, but it gives you a sense of where you are. So, you look at all these and you go, and what's my total cholesterol, doc? I still get this question, right? The patient comes in, what's my total cholesterol? I said, I don't know, and I don't even care. What's your shoe size? What's your shoe size? Because that's how much it matters, okay? So, yeah, we wanna see the number, but in, in relevance to all of this, does it really matter? Not so much. This is one of the most interesting studies that some of my students have ever seen. Yeah. Okay, so there's lots of studies on statins and statins are supposed to help us with heart disease, but this, this begs the question. Now what this is, this is a five year study. So for five years, uh, the Swedish government tracked the use of statins, okay? And so the gray bars showed that over five years, statin use tripled. The population tripled over time in terms of the statin use. And yet when we look at the occurrence of acute heart attacks, the occurrence of acute heart attacks in women, death rates from acute heart attacks, do you see much change? I don't see much change, okay? I don't see heart attacks dropping like a stone. I don't see deaths dropping like a stone. In fact, they look kind of level. There might have been some improvement, but not a whole lot. I don't say this because I don't think anybody should take a statin. I say this because when you look at that kind of a study, we have to justify how are we going to reverse heart disease. If you had an option, lifestyle versus statin, which one would you pick? Lifestyle. I'd pick lifestyle and a heartbeat. It's far more powerful. Does that mean statins don't have a place? No, they have a place and they can be used and they should be used when appropriate. But in this culture of ours, Oh, your cholesterol is high and your stress tests look bad. Here's your statin. We're done. Have a good day. And I just don't want anybody to live under that false pretense that a statin is going to save them from cardiovascular collapse because it's not the best possibility. So do these myths hold us back that cholesterol is the cause of heart disease? You guys know better at this point. Saturated fat and cholesterol don't cause heart disease. We were built to manage saturated fats. What kind of fats are worse than saturated fats? Trans fats, man-made fats, hydrogenated fats. You guys are smart, right? Margarine, that's much worse than saturated fat. Our bodies are built to handle saturated fat. Egg consumption causes heart disease, right? No, we know that to be true. We know that eggs are wonderful and they actually help keep blood sugar under control. Consumption of so-called heart-healthy vegetable oils. Get your canola, get your corn oil. Those are very harmful. They're omega-6 fats, we don't want those. Statin drugs don't treat the cause of heart disease. They lower LDL. That has some value, but it's a far cry from being the whole picture, and that the most powerful tool is lifestyle. There have been studies putting statins up against lifestyle changes, and in one study they used a low dose of red yeast rice and some fish oil and exercise and mindfulness training or just you know some meditative behaviors, and they far outpaced what the statins were able to do, okay? It showed it was far more powerful. So don't ever take me wrong, statins have a place, but to think that that's gonna stop a heart attack is, is hey, purely myth. Why is olive oil so good for you? And canola's not, they're both oils, and they're both vegetables. Right? And they're both vegetables, excellent observation. Corn oil and canola oil both come from a genetically modified plant. So from the get-go, we're already dealing with genetic modification, which is troublesome for our bodies. It can increase the risk of autoimmune problems, allergies, and even cancer risk. Genetically modified plants are not healthy for us. Number two, their amount of omega-6 is much higher. Olives, even though they're vegetables, have much more monosaturated fats. You have to understand that any oil has some omega-3s, some omega-6s, some omega-9s, 
some monosaturated, some saturated, okay? All within this one oil. And I have a chart that shows that. And so you look at the different fractions, and corn oil and canola oil is gonna have a ton of omega-6 fat, and you stack that right up against olive oil, the amount of omega-6 fats are very small. And this section of monosaturated fat is much bigger, okay? So the type of fat that's in there is much healthier. So monosaturated fats come in avocados and olive oil, Nuts are a good source of monosaturated fats, and they're very, very healthy for us. In fact, I make a protein shake in the morning most mornings, and I take my olive oil and I drizzle it right in there. It's good for me, good for my heart. Okay? All right. Well, who, what time is it? Anybody know? So, so, my, my bell's going off. Ding, ding, ding! Um, so, we'll, we'll pick up, we're going to pick up on thyroid. Um, uh, next, next, next meeting. It'll be a good one. Um, coconut oil has more saturated fat in it. Okay. Um, Chelsea, you want to talk about the benefits of coconut oil or some of the the value there? Medium chain triglycerides and. Um, in terms of heart disease or in just in. Just in general. Uh, no, go ahead. You can leave it on. Coconut oil, like Dr. Huber, is majority saturated fat, but um, like Dr. Huber said, it's a different type of saturated fat than what you're going to find in oh, what you're going to find in um, corn oil or um, partially or hydronated oil. So it's a different type of um, fat than what you would find in the man-made oil. So it's totally fine. I have had people say, "What? Well, it's saturated fat. I can't eat it." 100%. It's not all saturated fat. You have to remember that all fats have a, a array of different types of fats in them. And one of the benefits of coconut oil is the medium chain triglycerides, which are very good for cognitive function, very good for our brain function. Okay, thank you. So that's, I think, one of the benefits, and, uh, and it tastes really good. So nothing, nothing wrong with that. All right. Any questions on sugar, cholesterol, heart disease? Hemoglobin A1C, CRP, you guys are wizards now. You know all this stuff. At least, or at least you have a sense of it, uh, which is very important. So as you look at your labs, you know, these are the kind of questions that you don't have to track all this. That's what we'll, we're going to do. But you have a sense of why it's important and what we're looking at. We're looking at a bigger, broader spectrum of how can we identify risk and squash it before it turns into something really ugly. Okay? Excellent. All right. All right.